those companies need to be careful about pathogens. I think they all should be careful about pathogens. Like, we shouldn't forget that the kibble and can companies get recalled for disgusting pathogens pretty frequently, too. So I think that we, just talking about food safety is important. Um, and I think we could go ahead, yeah, I think we can change it. Uh, this question might have been a little better at the beginning of your presentation, but I was just curious what your outcome statement is, um, like eating travels or... It's next. <laughs> um, so, because that's the other biggest problem. So let's finish safety really fast and then we'll move into bats. So, um, we do believe that regardless of our pathogen protocol, so this actually also addresses your question a bit. So we believe that no matter what we do for food safety, we still have a responsibility to tell people about proper handling and hygiene. So right on our bags, it says, yeah. right on our bags, it says that this has been HPP. And if you, this is a poultry product, if you had the back of a bag of our red meat product right here, it would just say test and hold. Um, regardless of the fact that we've tested every bag or every batch, um, this, Safety instructions thing is not just on our every single one of our bags. It's also we have a whole page dedicated to it on our website. We believe that it's incredibly important that people understand these erogenies. I believe this is a bag of our freeze-dried product. I think that even the veterinary community is under the impression that freeze-drying kills pathogens. Newsflash, not the case. So I don't care if you freeze-dry that raw meat, you still need to test it for pathogens. Freeze-drying is really cool and special, and it can retain lots of dangerous, scary things. So regardless of how we test it and how this food is processed, we believe they should be not using plastic bowls, that they should be cleaning surfaces, washing their hands, practicing food safety. And they really, they should be doing that with their kibble too, right? Like, uh, food for thought. What's the risk of feeding this type of pathogen-checked product versus feeding. I think a lot of the questions that you guys gave were like contraindications, like who do I tell that they shouldn't do this because it's actually dangerous for them as a client or maybe for their pet. I mean, anybody immune compromised as far as making your own raw diet at home, but how would this one be any more dangerous than a kibble product? Like, I don't know if I can answer that. I, I don't know what the right answer there is. I guess I would always caution them and say this is a possibility. There are lots of veterinary oncologists who recommend HPP diets to their cancer patients uh, because they know that a raw diet or carbohydrate-free diet will help, but those dogs aren't chemotherapy. Yeah? So I would just say that those extruded diets and then like traditionally cooked diets, we know have much less recalls, and overall we see a much like significant I know. less it's pathogen loads. So why why would I say, well, feeding a raw diet is okay if you're being compromised like even this with HPP, when you have an extruded diet, when we know extruded diets are safer. But I'm not sure extruded diets are safer than this class of raw foods. I know they're safer than the guys doing the garbage. And that's really if there's a question, not as a statement. But nobody's done a survey on who has more bacteria in their foods, the guys HPP or the chemical diets. What's the answer to that? I don't know. It would be an interesting thing to find out. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, the FDA did that study, I think, in 2013, where they looked at raw foods and commercial foods. I don't remember the exact numbers of the raw foods. But they, they were looking at raw foods that didn't have pathogens. I don't think they specified. Um, it exactly. Went, so some of them may have had an HPP, some of them may not, because there were certainly companies doing HPP at the time. Sure. That would have been after Primal started. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but they didn't specify the results, but they found one out of 480 samples of kibble diets was positive, and something like more 20 percent of the raw diets. Just, and there's been one recall for cooked diets um, in the last two years for, um, and it's actually one of the fresh diets. It's not a uh, fresh cooked diet, not canned or kibble. And there were 27 recalls in 2018 for raw. Just so you guys have some stats. Yeah, thank you. It's good stats, and it's. The reason that we are consistently pushing for better safety control standards. Because there are a few companies out there who believe in safety control, and there are like probably hundreds who don't. So there are many more raw food companies not doing anything for safety than there are who are. So I think that it's very likely that any 
of those studies who don't separate. I, I reached out to the woman who did the study, I think in the UK a couple of weeks ago, it was published about the Campylobacter and the Clostridium positive samples in raw food diets, um, which is another interesting problem. Um, but they only tested diets that had no pathogen control standards. They didn't test any that were doing any sort of uh, protocols whatsoever, never mind HPV. So I think it's an interesting problem. I don't think it's cut and dry. I think we need to ask more questions. And I, again, they're going to do it. So we should talk about it. And we should talk about how to do it better. And we're always here to talk about what else we could be doing. Like, I'm happy to, to recommend to do more. We just need to know what those things are and what you guys think is the most important. So moving on to balance. So a lot of people. When I say raw diets, I think I'm talking about meat-only diets. So a lot of, when I was working in practice, when I heard somebody say they were feeding a raw diet, I pictured someone like chopping up chicken thighs and like liver and just feeding that. Um, and a lot of them were doing that. Uh, that is a considered prey model. So people who feed like literally just meat, they will sometimes feed some tripe um, to get fiber content. I, it makes me want to a little bit in my mouth. Um, that is different. So that prey model diet is not what primal does. So we use a BARF model diet, or acronym ever, uh, biologically appropriate raw feeding or bones and raw foods. Um, that diet for dogs is 80% meat, 20% produce and supplements. The 80% meat consists of 80% muscle, 10% organ, and ten, or 10% filtering organ, and 10% ground bone. <coughs> Um, and then 20% produce. The feline diets are higher in meat to produce ratio. Um, they have very, even though we're putting in 20% produce, it's very, very low in carbohydrate. Because salad's not carbs, right? Like, if you want something that's incredibly carbohydrate rich, you need like potatoes or wheat or something very starchy that's cooked and made bioavailable. Go ahead. So are you not putting carbohydrates into your diet? There are some carbohydrates naturally occurring in the fruits and vegetables, but we do not put a source of carbohydrate in our diet. So like no grain, no not. meat. So then how do you justify that with the recent links to DCM? Do you think that the links to DCM are caused by a lack of carbohydrate in the food? It's a good question. Loaded one, but I like it. <laughs> no, I, I don't believe that DCM is related to lack of carbohydrate. What is DCM? What's happening in DCM? The heart muscle is not able to utilize amino acids. And what are amino acids coming from? Protein. So the amino acid proteins that come from vegetables are the proteins in those vegetables. So in wheat, it would be gluten. I forget what the one in potato is. So it's the proteins of those vegetables that are providing the cysteine and the thiamine, and the taurine, and the lysine for that synthesis. It's not the starch content of those vegetables. Yeah, go ahead. So I read on your website that your um, suggestion kind of after that came out was that you should start feeding more um, of your raw goat milk. And I was wondering why you think that um, because as canines get older, they get lactose intolerant usually. So in what, why would they be absorbing that? So our goat milk does not contain high levels of lactose at all. Um, our goat milk, it, goat milk in general has less lactose. It's also raw milk with a probiotic adage, and the lactic acid bacteria as it begins its digestive process on the milk destroys all the lactose. So raw cultured milk, that's what kefir or kefir or cultured milks or yogurts, that's why they don't provide a problem for lactose intolerance. So our goat milk doesn't have a lactose problem, but the reason I put it on there on that DCM blog is because I got a crap load of phone calls from a bunch of veterinary professional friends that were like, I've been doing the milk on top of all these crazy people's diets because I believe it's helping them break down their food better, so break down those things that they're having a hard time absorbing with their amino acids. And they, they sent me the study that I linked to on that blog of how much bioavailable taurine is in goat milk specifically. Goat milk is known as the universal milk replacer and is what we used to use before we had commercially available formula for all mammalian species because it's so incredibly digestible. Um, goat milk's really special. I've been half writing an update to that, that blog I wrote in, I think, July. 
Um, and we've learned so much more since then, and I think it severely needs an update, but it's been a busy quarter. Yeah, as far as like the raw milk laws, are you allowed to sell raw milk outside of California? Yes, and actually even in Washington as of two months ago. But how are you allowed to cross the state lines thing? Because then it's now through the USDA. Or because it's sold for animal consumption and it's colorized with turmeric. Good question. Every state uh, has their own laws. We cannot sell it in the state of New Jersey or the state of Nevada. And we couldn't sell it in Washington until a couple months ago. Go ahead. So this isn't specifically about your guys' food, but we're running out of time. Um, so I also read on one of your blogs about um, questioning your veterinarian about performing vaccine titers and if they do three year rabies protocols and things. I was just wondering, as a food company, why were you asking your it's a blog clients. i mean we talk about um, like behavior and we have a lot of our customers reach out to us about vaccines and i struggle with the people who relate raw feeding with not vaccinating their dog um, and so really that was uh, an attempt to talk about how vaccines are important not how important um, so most of our competitors do the opposite uh, and give lots of information on how we can opt that in my favorite veterinary blogger does the same thing. Not my favorite veterinary blogger. I will really leave her unnamed. Um, so I I think vaccines are important. My dog's a vaccine. I do tire my dogs because that's very appropriate. Um, but I think vaccines are important. Uh, and I didn't say they weren't. But I did say that the reason I wrote that blog is because I feel like a lot of the people who move to this side of the fence and hear from their veterinarian that they shouldn't feed a raw diet then stop going to the veterinarian, period. And that blog was intended to tell them, look for a veterinarian that feels the same way you do and that's open to having a discussion so that you continue to go. Don't forget, I am a veterinary professional first. I've been doing this for four years. I've been feeding it for 10 years. Um, but I believe in medicine. I don't see a holistic vet. I never have. I am at my veterinary office like every week with my dogs. So I, I think it's important that we marry these things instead of pushing those people away. If we stop talking to those people and stop allowing them to do titers or to talk about the fact that over-vaccinated is staring them, they're just going to stop coming. So we can't freak out. Like we have to have a conversation and a reasonable one. And I think it's important. And I think those things are really related, um, to be honest. So I want to talk about balance before. I know some of you have to go to your own or something. So go. Just for those who are, if there's no class in here. And so if you need to go to your next class, go ahead. But there's no rush in terms of, I mean, there is, but like. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. To I just want to make sure we talk about balance because I think it's the definitely, uh, honestly, Unless I'm in this room and I'm talking about veterinary professionals, most of them are more concerned about that than they are about that. So, at least once we've been in practice, because we actually saw a lot more dogs having problems with non-balanced raw diets than we did sick from raw diets with GI distress. So, especially long-term. So, all of our diets are complete and balanced um, by testing post-formulation. So we test them after they've been blended. We send them out to a laboratory and have the apple panels done when they um, are all passed for all life stages with the exception of the rabbit, which right now I can't get the phosphorus low enough for the new requirement. So that one's not for large breed puppy growth, um, but everything else. We may have to, a couple of our bone-in poultries might also go to no large breed growth on redoing their panels. So everything is tested. We also completed um, feeding trials at UC Davis for our feline diet and at Summit Farms for our canine back in 2012, I think, um, and pacifying colors. Um, I did digestibility studies this year comparing frozen and freeze-dried on our lamb because it's the most suspect with DCM. Um, I just wanted to be diligent and because we had done full feeding trials we didn't do digestibility and I thought it was important. Um, they're incredibly digestible, more digestible than most of the highly digestible prescription diets, which makes sense. They're raw food. Um, so yes, they are balanced. We are very rigorous about their balance, but there are a lot of diets out there who complain, 
kind of um, saying that the balance that are definitely not. So definitely something to, I just think following the WASABA guidelines and calling and asking those questions is probably the best bet. And teaching your clients to do that. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I was actually just sort of back up, but I was wondering what your thoughts of sustainability were for this, just because we already have having trouble feeding our own human population, and more people started feeding like over a million dogs, 80% of meat diets, we're not going to have enough. It's a great question. So actually, really, when you think about the fact that we're using whole meat instead of rendered, we're using probably the same amount of animal as those kibble companies are. Some, some yes, some no. But we try as best we can to source the things that humans are not eating. So for our mammal needs, a lot of the muscle is coming from heart. Um, and for our poultry, a lot of the protein is coming from the trim that's, so after they um, take the breast out, they push the breastplate through a mechanical separator to get all the meat out of the rest of it that's difficult to do by hand. We use that for a lot of our poultry. We try really, Matt is a total fruitcake crunch nut uh, and is really, really dedicated to making it as sustainable as we can. Um, I think it does present an interesting challenge. Um, I think it's something that we just need to keep an open dialogue about. I don't think it's a good excuse for feeding our dogs garbage, um, but I do think it's something that we should talk about, right? Um, so, I think it's a good question. Any questions about balance? I have some fun, like if you guys come up and get some of the literature, we, and we have it right on our website that tells you like, kind of generally, he doesn't want to give away any trade secrets, but it'll tell you generally what each ingredient is supplying as far as nutrient goes. Like our, we use quinoa sprout powder for incredibly stable multi-complex vitamin D. Yes, go. Um, how much does, on average, would this cost a month? Depends on the size of your dog. So a six pound cat, a six pound bag of chicken patties costs thirty six dollars and it has twelve patties. So is how do we address if we want to have our raw meat to this uh, raw food to this standard of process of processing and trying to obtain those yeah. bacteria levels? If somebody wants to feed a raw food diet but can't afford to pay for this kind of thing. What do we say? What do you I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. So myself, when, when it fixed my max, I was a vet tech, and I didn't make any money. Uh, and I had three dogs, and Max weighed eight pounds, so for me. So I could afford to feed him 100% raw diet. Um, I had two other dogs, and once I saw how much it changed Max's life, I could not give it to them, uh, but I couldn't afford to give it to them full time. So I just gave them whatever I could afford. I mean, if you had a, a couple salads a week, and you haven't been eating any fresh food before, you still get healthier. Right? Like I think when we're out talking about retail stores, we talk a lot about you don't have to go big or go home. Like you can add some raw fresh foods and still see a benefit. We do a lot of supplement products. Uh, we do a ton of like toppers, some of them are cooked, that are fresh food items that are pretty inexpensive, that work really well to increase the digestibility of the highly processed pickles um, without breaking the bank. If we to convince our clients that this is the best route for them to take digestibility products. Um, maybe if they have a chronic systemic disease, sure. could help them. But if we're convincing that this is the best option, but they can't afford that option, are we not pushing them towards maybe a raw food diet that's not good for them? In a sense oh, you mean accidentally pushing them there? Yeah. You could be, certainly. And I think that's where it's important to allow them to take, I mean, anything you're doing with them, they're going to have that dilemma. Right? So like, you have to give them the, like all of the options and let them decide where their where their budget and their like I don't know risk level lies. Right. So like, you could do it this way. You could do it this way. I'll tell you, most of the time this is cheaper than the RX diet. Um, and we were talking. I don't know where she went. We were talking last night about how much she's spending on the meds for her dog. Um, and if the diet worked for her dog like it did for mine, uh, she'd be spending a fraction of a month, I'll tell you that. So I think it really depends on the case and the client. And most of them, I mean, most of a lot of our customers are not wealthy and they're just doing the best that they can. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for the previous slide, you highlighted that they should 
saying that the growth diet is 80% of the minimum? Is that just assuming that the APCO assumes less digestibility? Yes, I kind of like that. I added that really last minute because I found it in my APCO book when I was looking for something else. Um, APCO assumes, APCO's guaranteed analysis like requirements are assuming that the diet is 80% digestible. Who asked about the DCM? Maybe we don't know that with you. So, I think the problem with BCM is that those diets have not, there's no way any of them have done digestibility studies. And if they're basing their amino acid amounts on the AFCO standard and saying it's balanced, but the diet is 60, 70 percent digestible because it's loaded with legumes and the junk can't possibly break down because they've been cooked into oblivion, uh, hell no, they're not using those. They're cooking them right out, right? So, I mean, it's just a theory, but it would be interesting to study. So, AFCO standards are basing their standards on that food being 80% digestible. Our protein digestibility, 94% for the frozen and 89 for the freeze dried. So, I, uh, yeah. I just wanted to double check uh, my own understanding, I guess. Um, so you said you did feeding trials, but then on your uh, AFCO statement, it says it met the requirements, not AFCO feeding trial. So our freeze dried, because we didn't do a separate one with the freeze dried, we cannot consider those in the same family because they have a different processing step, mm -hmm. which is why I wanted to do both digestibility studies to make sure that that protein digestibility and and um, fat digestibility was over 80%. Uh, so, but we still can't claim family method on those. We can claim family method on all of the frozen varieties. So our feeding trials were done with our frozen varieties. I think we did full free feeding trials with the cats with freeze drive at Davis because it was easy to do because cats need like three to four nights a day. Um, we have not done them on dogs yet. I'm looking into it. I would like to. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little on the sun Ross better than the Ross statement? So that's like our, that's our, this was like a, what are we telling our retail stores? Um, so we talk a lot about the, the cost problem um, and we treat it like an apple a day thing, right? Like, is it okay if you buy breakfast cereal for convenience or eat a pizza on the weekend? Yeah, absolutely, but you should also be eating some fresh foods. So when we're talking to our retailers or to consumers, we're talking to them about like, you don't have to feed all raw to see a benefit. Feeding a small amount of fresh food with your processed food makes a huge difference, just like it does for us. I think that that, for me, was the big take home of that DCM blog I was doing, is I was like, which now I want to redo because I'm worried. Some people think that what's happening with those diets and DCM is that something in those foods is blocking the absorption or utilization of taurine, and that terrifies the hell of me, to be honest. Uh, and so, in that case, you can have all the fresh food you want. It's not going to do a damn thing. But in general, I think adding some fresh food has a benefit. We know it does for us. Why wouldn't it do so for us? Yeah. Maybe I misunderstood you earlier, but didn't you say that when they feed partly raw and part kibble, that it slows down the digestion and that's a negative thing? If the diet is loaded with packages, it could be a negative thing. If you add in question. So if you add raw meat from the grocery store that's loaded with salmonella to a kibble diet, you could make the dog really sick, not just with vomiting and diarrhea, but with the endotoxins that come when salmonella reproduces. Um, if the diet is pathogen-free, you'll, you'll speed the digestibility of the kibble because the raw has enzymes, it has probiotics, it has moisture, um, it's incredibly digestible. So it'll speed the digestion of the kibble, but it certainly won't be as quick as it would be if you're feeding it all. Good question. Yeah. So would you do you recommend more one than the other, like feeding the raw kind of as a separate meal or feeding it crumbled on top kind of thing? We recommend bo both. Um, whatever works best for you. We have a lot of products that are. Um, really unique so that whatever's convenient or affordable for the customer, they can do that thing that looks like kibble is a frozen raw topper. So you can literally scoop your kibble and scoop that right out of the freezer and add like warm water from the tap and shake it to make a gravy. It'll thaw the raw and hydrate the kibble at the same time. It's super quick and convenient. You don't have to touch any gross things. Like that one. 
Um, the freeze dry the product you can crumble over the top or feed the tree or hydrate with water it works really well. Um, the broth is easy to pour over the top. A lot of people will buy our patty since it's the most economical way to feed it and then do what you said, feed the kibble in the morning and a patty at night. That's fine to do, but I find that most of the time those customers end up adding some raw to that kibble meal because either the dog doesn't want to eat it anymore or they, um, they, they start to notice the GI upset that's coming when they feed uh, kibble by itself that they didn't notice before. Yeah? So if you're switching between like raw and you know, like kibble if someone is how do you, and they're getting GI, GI upset, how do you know if that's from the kibble or just because you are transitioning your diet? So Good question. Um, I don't know. I think when we, our recommendations for transitioning dogs is always to start with a slow blended transition, not to separate meals. So um, I think it's difficult to do that from the get-go with a dog who has GI sensitivity because I think if they get an upset stomach, you're not going to know why. Um, so I think it makes more sense to blend in slowly. I usually recommend the project. You can sample a kibble shape one because you can add like two or three and then really slowly work your way up. Yeah. 